Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It is Tuesday, August the 22nd, 2023. Time is a funny thing. As we move forward and we leave things, I think we begin to miss them. It's certainly true of empires. As we move into a, a post-imperial world, we seem to have an increasing nostalgia for the great empires of the past. Uh, we've done a number of shows on that uh, in the past on Keenon. We did one with the Ottoman historian, Mark David Bauer, who has a new book um, about the Ottomans uh, called The Ottomans, Khan, Caesars and Caliphs, which I think has a relatively optimistic take on the nature of the empire. We also did a show a couple of months ago with the Princeton University historian, a young woman, Natasha Wheatley. Wonderful show. She is nostalgic, I think, in many ways for the Habsburg Empire. She has a new book out, The Life and Death of States. I think what we miss about the imperial world is that diversity of cities and places, uh, very much in contrast with our current nation state world and we dealt with that nostalgia in a conversation i had with uh, a young writer jacob mikanowski who has a wonderful new book out um goodbye eastern europe an intimate history of a divided land that divided land of course being formerly east central europe a imperial land one man who's all too familiar with the world of empires is our guest today uh he's one of america's leading writers really on politics, history, culture, geography. Robert D. Kaplan, in fact, he wrote a, a wonderful review of the Mikanowski book recently for the Wall Street Journal. Everyone's read something by Kaplan, whether it's on the Adriatic um, or on the Balkans or on the American involvement uh, all around the world. And he has a new book out, very much in keeping with the themes I've been talking about, the loom of time between empire and anarchy from the Mediterranean to China. It's a wise book about our imperial world, and I'm thrilled and honored that Robert D. Kaplan is joining us from his home in Western Massachusetts. Robert, welcome. Congratulations on the new book. What is it, you. number 23, 24? We're 22. Thank you, Andrew, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. So uh, am I right, Robert? Are we stumbling and slipping into this imperial world? And, and as a consequence, are we increasingly becoming nostalgic for the world we're leaving behind? Well, um, in this book, I concentrate on the greater Middle East from the Mediterranean to China. And this is a world which has been imperial for going back thousands of years, you know, before the British and French, before the Ottomans, there were the Abbasids, Umayyads, Hafsids, Fatimids, and others. The Middle East, for most of its history, was always in, ruled in an imperial sense. And that has Im impeded, made more difficult the emergence of modern states and democracy. Uh, empire provided order. For the first time in the in the history of the greater Middle East, there is no imperial power. The Cold War empires are gone, too. And without a, and an imperial overlay, the, you know, the, you know, it becomes like a struggle to, you know, to avoid anarchy. Um, in the West, we look at the Middle East as arguing about democracy and authoritarianism. But historically... And, uh, and when you actually interview people on the ground there, and this is a book of reporting, it's really a case of finding a middle ground between empire on one extreme and anarchy on another. You know, finding a form of order that's non-coercive and stable. And that's the struggle almost everywhere you go. We've done many shows on the various crises of the Middle East, those that word crisis seems to go together. We did one with a, a DC scholar, uh, Stephen Simon, has a new book on the rise and fall of American ambition in the Middle East. Is the problem, Robert, with American policy that in the Middle East is it's always taken for granted that the future of Middle East is a nation state future. 
and they've never really, American policymakers, both of the left and on the right, have never come to terms with the imperial quality of the region? I think that's partly true. That's part of it, you know, because, you know, because it's an imperial quality. It, it, you know, it makes it difficult to develop and articulate nation states. And if you're not going to have modern states, the emergence of democracy is going to be infinitely postponed. And, you know, and and there's going to be many cracks along the way. Um, It's also a case that you have, in some respects, two different kinds of states in the Middle East. You have what I call age-old clusters of civilization, like Egypt and Tunisia, which have been like organized political communities going back to antiquity and before. But then you have what I call these vague geographical expressions, like Libya, like Syria, like Iraq, which were never coherent states or communities to begin with. Thus, when the Arab Spring came in 2011 and toppled a lot of the dictators in the area, the result in these age-old clusters of civilization was a battle for democracy, but but it did not lead to anarchy because these were real states. Uh, you know, they may not have been democratic, but they were states and they were at, the, at root stable. But when uh, dictators were toppled in these vague geographical expressions like Libya and Syria and Iraq, it led to, you know, it led to chaos. These are, of course, all the, 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 the chaotic states that you talk about are all legacies of the colonial world, the European colonial world the world of Sykes and Picot and the redrawing of these maps. Um, Do we still have, Robert, a moral responsibility, we, Westerners, Europeans, North Americans, to make sense of this, to undo the mistakes of the past, or are those mistakes now essentially undoable? Uh, Those mistakes are undoable. Uh, They're part of the weft and wharf of history. Uh, so to speak. Think of it this way. The world is more claustrophobic, more anxious, more interconnected than ever before. The interconnectivity between the greater Middle East and Europe and China and the West is greater than it's ever been before. So like it or not, we're stuck with it. You know, we're stuck with this interaction. And this interaction was not just a matter of drawing artificial boundaries, as you alluded to. It was also just the the, the technological and cultural influence of the West on the Middle East for the last few hundred years. For instance, um, between um, a Persian civilization and the Mediterranean, In between, you have Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. Iraq and Syria fell prey to Baathism. And Baathism was was sort of a a mixture of East Bloc style socialism and um, and Arab nationalism. And because of that, it, it didn't work and it led to extreme coercion. So you had these artificial... Uh, immensely oppressive Ba'athist states between Iran and the Mediterranean. And when the Cold War ended and when the U.S. invaded Iraq and so on and so forth, you had the total disintegration of these states, which were and the reason. But the reason why they were so uh, they were so oppressive to begin with. uh, The Ba'athists is partially because of Western influence, because Baathism, East Bloc socialism came from the West. Uh, you know, it, you know, um, it's um, nationalism, Arab nationalism originally came from the West. So it's this interaction between the West and the Middle East, which has really caused so many of these crises. It's like we cannot help ourselves. Many years ago, Robert, I was taught uh, realist international politics by Ken Waltz at UC Berkeley, who basically argued that the history of the world is the history of empires. And I wonder how you would respond to the argument, well, maybe the age of the classic empires from the Abbasids to the Ottomans to the Habsburgs has gone, but every state one way or the other has imperial ambitions. The United States is no different. China is an imperial state now. Even Iran in its own 
regional way is an empire. How would you distinguish between the geostrategic ambitions of Iran or China from the classic age of empire? Um, I think it's very much interrelated because um, Iran, uh, you know, you know, the Persian Empire, the Achaemenids, the Sassanids, you know, etc. Um, uh, all, uh, you know, all, um, you, you know, all, you know, it, throughout Iran's history, it was an imperial history. It was a great imperial history since antiquity. And, it, you know, and when Russia, China, Turkey today, their foreign policies are infused by their imperial past. It's only in the West, really, where we're ashamed of empire. In much of the rest of the world, be it Turkey, Iran, China, Russia, uh, people take, take, you know, take their imperial legacies with, you know, look at their imperial legacies with pride. Uh, to a great extent. It's like the, the history of dividing up the world according to political and natural borders is an imperial history. But imperialism for the first time in the greater Middle East is more or less dead. And that accounts for a lot of the instability there. It's like a finding a new modicum of order, uh, yeah, a, a new modicum of order. Because we're right in the wake of the world of empire, uh, we're obsessed with it. And because we're obsessed with it, we had, you know, there's, and we're obsessed with the crimes of empire and the mistakes of empire. Um, but again, as the years and decades go on, um, I think we will look at empire much less emotionally than we do now. In a couple of months, I've got the English political philosopher John Gray on the show. I'm sure you're familiar with his yes. work. He has a new book coming out on uh, Hobbes and Leviathan. Uh, he argues that we're living increasingly in a, in a Hobbesian age. I I'm looking forward to the conversation. It should be fascinating to have both you and he on the same show. Would you agree with Gray? I mean, as, as the arguments about Hobbes and security and power, are they as relevant in the first quarter of the 21st century as they were in the in the 17th century when Hobbes was originally making his argument? Uh, yes, I would agree with John uh, on this. Remember, Hobbes, though he's looked on now by people who don't know better as a kind of a doom and gloom philosopher, was actually an idealistic liberal in a sense, because he thought that order, you know, the creation, you know, order is it comes before freedom because without order, there's no freedom for anybody. And, and, and the erection of order and that from that, that of an organized state would lead to the to lead to development and the solving of many social ills. Um, so, you know, to believe in Hobbes is to believe that the paramount issue in many parts of the world is, in a, you know, is the, uh, is the restitution and the creation of political order. Order within states, order between states. So it's, it's sort of always a very Hobbesian world. Um, we've gotten away from Hobbes um, because we, you know, we've tended to think that every place was going to be a stable democracy and get along with each other. This was the post-Cold War um, uh, you know, the end I, of history, as our friend Francis yeah. Fukuyama so famously yeah. and, or infamously noted, he's been on the show. It's interesting you talk about Hobbes as a doom and gloom thinker, but correct. Uh, your book has already been embraced by uh, reviewers. Uh, Kirkus gave it, as always, a, a starred review, suggesting it was brilliantly delivered. But also notes, and this isn't a criticism, it's just an observation of the book itself, little encouraging news. Do you see yourself in some ways, Robert, as a, as a doom and gloom writer? Absolutely not. In fact, uh, if you read this book carefully, it has a stream of, of, of optimism in it, and it's this way. It's from the title itself. The Loom of Time comes from a phrase of Goethe that was adopted by Toynbee to indicate that we think we're going around in circles, but we're actually making progress little by little. It goes back to Penelope's, um, Le Penelope's la labor on the loom, waiting for her husband Odysseus to return home. 
Um, and the loom of time for the greater Middle East indicates that, you know, according to the thesis I'm proposing in this book, that the Middle East will make progress. It will go forward. It's just not going to do so according to a Western script. It's not going to do so according to holding elections and having stable democracies. It's not linear. Its progress is not linear. It's very convoluted and it takes time. And one, for instance, one of the things I say is that the Middle East may become more and more like the consultative regimes in Morocco, Jordan and Oman, which are, a, which are authoritarian in one sense, but provide laws and civil liberties in another sense. Well, I want to talk about that after the break. We're going to take a short break. We're talking to the, the great American writer, uh, travel political writer, Robert Kaplan, has a new book out, fascinating new book, very controversial in its own way, um, The Loom of Time. I want to make a note of our sponsor, thank the guys at Liberties, a quarterly journal of culture and politics, which deals, I think, like Robert Kaplan's work with a loom of time and understanding the world in a sophisticated way. We're going to do a short uh, ad for uh, Liberties, and then we're going to be back with Robert Kaplan to talk more optimistically about how he believes the region, the greater Middle East, will evolve in the 21st century. So don't leave us. We'll be back in about 20 seconds, everyone. Beyond the news, the noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties is not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. And you can find out more about Liberties at libertiesjournal.com. I'm not sure the guys at Liberties are going to be thrilled with your message, Robert, though. Um, you talked before the break about a new kind of political model evolving. You wrote about that in, um, in the book, uh, which got excerpted about a, a chapter on Saudi Arabia channeling Singapore I've written about Singapore. We've all written about Singapore. It doesn't seem to be anything very democratic about it. It seems to be the most acceptable manifestation of authoritarianism. Or am I being unfair on the Singapore model? Um, Singapore is a quasi-democracy. Singapore was as poor as the poorest places in sub-Saharan Africa in the 1960s. And through meritocracy, good government organization it became one of the one of the easiest places to do business with one of the highest standards of living in the world all this without oil and being surrounded by enemies at the time in malaya and in indonesia um, so Singapore is a good model uh, you know i find that intellectuals love to rhapsodize about um, uh, uh, Nelson Mandela and Václav Havel, but leaders around the developing world looking for a model to actually move their countries in standard of living and quality of life forward tend to tend to tend to look to Lee Kuan Yew. Um, and Saudi Arabia is an example of that. The Saudi leadership, including uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, NBS, uh, openly consider uh, Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore, a model. Now, um, there's a lot in the chapter on Saudi Arabia about all the social reforms that have been taking place there. And, the, and I also do not neglect to mention all the horrible human rights violations to go, to go with it. Um, you know, I end the chapter basically saying that, um, that Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, is like Icarus. He may be flying too close to the sun with wax wings and it may all melt because you can't have technocracy, entrepreneurship, a dynamic society and a totally repressive state forever. You can have both for a time at this current level of the development of the society. But at, but at some point, people will demand, you know, individual freedoms. 
maybe he's not just a fictional character, MBS. Maybe he's not just Icarus. Is this just a repeat of history? You're a man who always seen the, 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 the loom of history everywhere. I mean, are we returning, uh, Robert, to uh, the enlightened despotism of the 18th century, of, of Catherine the Great, of Frederick the Great? Um, of the Habsburg experiments. It seems yeah, in I, many ways as if MBS is just the the Saudi version of Catherine the Great. Uh, yeah, you know, he could be. Uh, you know, I look to the Habsburgs and the Ottomans as examples of relatively for their time enlightened cosmopolitan empires uh, where minorities were protected and in fact, minorities, you know, stopped being protected with the collapse of those empires and the erection of moni ethnic, you know, moni ethnic states that oppressed them. And uh, but Saudi Arabia, I would say, is is becoming more open, more liberal on one hand and more extreme and repressive on the other. It's um, you know, there is no unity of goodness in the world. You can't have it. You can't like, you know, have villains and um, you can't have villains and heroes all, you know, all, all together. Um, we deal with Saudi Arabia because we have interests there great interest there, and we will keep doing so uh, there. Um, the Saudis, uh, you know, the issue now is China, because the Saudis sell much of their oil and gas to China, and the Chinese do not give the Saudis lectures on human rights and democracy and civil liberties like we do. So the Saudis have moved closer to China, and fearing that, um, the Biden administration is trying to organize a diplomatic rapprochement between Israel and Saudi Arabia, a kind of mini Pax Americana between the Saudis and the Israelis in order to, to stem the tide of this Chinese pseudo imperial influence in the Middle East. It always seems as if America has been in front of history, if you like, um, knitting time but you seem to be suggesting that america now is is trailing time it doesn't really understand biden certainly doesn't understand these broader historical trends is there any truth to that Robin? um look the limitation of democracy is you can get one administration going in one direction and another administration going in another direction. During the Cold War and before, the moderates controlled both political parties. So you had center left foreign policy and center right foreign policy. And because they were both anchored in the center, there was a continuity and people trusted America. Now, with the end of the Cold War, you have vast swings. You have a right and a left. The center has been hollowed out in American politics, and, and that has had a deleterious effect on foreign policy. Because even when we do things that, that countries uh, like, uh, they still don't trust us because they don't know what kind of a government we'll get next in two or three years. One thing that does change over time, uh, again, I don't need to tell you this, Robert, is technology. And technology, Western technology, network technology has had a huge impact on this greater Middle East from the Arab Spring and its failure onwards. Um, MBS seems to be levering technology to create new surveillance networks. Uh, what do you make of that? I remember that um, Catherine the Great imported Jeremy Bentham to create the first panopticon in, in, in 18th century Russia. Should we be concerned, we and I, you know, we in the West, uh, defenders of liberty, should we be concerned with the way in which, again, it seems to be our technology, the internet is being reinvented in the greater Middle East as an agent of surveillance and repression? Um, when the internet first came about in a big mass way, it was seen as liberating. Remember, Mark Zuckerberg was going to connect 
infect hundreds of millions of Chinese with us and we were all going to be friends. This is the late 90s, early 2000s or so. The Internet is value neutral, like technology is value neutral. It can be used for good means or it can be used for bad means. But what? But one thing with technology is there is an intensification of political life. There's an intensification of connectedness between one part of the world and the other so that we're all stuck with each other so that the very finite size of the earth becomes itself a destabilizing element as there are more and more people more and more connected than ever before do you remember where you were in 2009 2010 where the zuckerbergs of the world were waxing eloquently about the role of technology in undermining uh, uh, authoritarianism in Egypt and uh, Tunisia and Syria. Yes, I was I was reporting overseas, and um, and uh, you know I immediately said that the Arab Spring would you know had a possibility in places like Egypt and Tunisia, but no possibility in places like Syria and Iraq and Libya, because at the end of the day. This, the Egypts and Tunisias of the world were real communities. They were real political communities with all of their problems. And the other places that I mentioned were not. They were just disparate piece, puzzle pieces on a map that had been artificially put together and which had been ruled by abject authoritarianism to hold them together. And once that disappeared, once that was disrupted by the Arab Spring, there would be nothing left. We've talked about power, Robert, as being a constant. You've also written about geography as being perhaps the defining quality of, of, of making sense of the world. Your book, The Revenge of Geography, enormously successful and influential. We've done a number, a number of other uh, shows on the power of geography, one with Tim Marshall. I know you know his work and with Ian Morris. What is it about the geography of the greater Middle East that, say, distinguishes it from Africa? You've written broadly and, and rather pessimistically about Africa. You've talked about anarchy unbound in, a, in an interesting piece in the New Statesman, the new scramble for Africa. What is it about geography that distinguishes the greater Middle East in terms of this post-imperial world from Africa? Well, the Middle East is arid, you know, compared to the lush geographies of China and India compared to Europe, compared to sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East is an arid zone. It's a desert zone. Um, and that has led to greater centralization of power in specific places, originally oases, but now, you know, capital... Uh, capital cities, and while ge and while technology can mitigate that to a significant degree, it's still you know you're still stuck with vast deserts with limited water supplies and growing populations, so that water becomes a very uh, prized commodity throughout the Middle East. And presumably, of course, uh, global warming will only compound all this. Yes. Uh, Climate change will compound all this because it will change the agricultural cycle and lead to even greater water shortages. Robert, do we need to be a little bit more creative in how we define democracy in the greater Middle East? Uh, last um, year, we had Shadi Hamid. Again, I'm sure you're familiar with his work. Uh, he's at the Brookings Institute, suggesting that Americans misunderstand democracy and therefore their assault on the supposedly democratic nature of political parties like the Muslim Brotherhood. Do we need to become a little bit more liberal, shall we say, in our definition of democracy in the greater Middle East? Um, I think democracy in the greater Middle East should be determined in terms of the building of civilian institutions. Um, you know, it's, you know, to hold an election does not make a country a democracy. A democracy, you assume, it has institutions of governance um, where minority rights are protected. 
It's about building a civil society, whether or not it goes by the legalistic terminology of holding elections. Um, Oman, Oman, for instance, is a country of an absolute royal dictatorship, but where people have a lot of civil liberties. Um, so it's those nuances which are which are missing. It's a matter of studying individual countries more and not just applying fixed labels that work more in the West than they do in the Middle East. So, uh, and I've been to Oman and Qatar and, of course, Dubai. It's it's the Omani model, Robert. And does that reflect just the little bit more enlightened nature of the royal family there in Oman versus Qatar or uh, or the UAE? Yes, it does. Uh, that has a lot to do with it. Also, remember, Oman was a great Indian Ocean seafaring empire. It had colonies in East Africa. It had community communities, I should say. It had communities in, in the South Seas and what is today Indonesia. Um, it had, a, a, a you know, even though it's on a desert, it also had a degree of cosmopolitanism, which is lacking in. Um, elsewhere in the region. Also, there's something basic. We've been talking, I've been writing a lot about geography, but geography at the end of the day is only 50% of the story. The other 50% is Shakespeare, as I like to put it. It's the individuals. You know, geography is the backdrop to, to, polit to world politics, but the actual drama is played out by individuals. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's, it, it, you know, 50 percent of all this is just individuals and their different personalities and the demons that affect them. Final question on this Shakespearean tableau, uh, Robert. What about Israel in this? It, it always seems to me as if Israel's becoming more and more part of the world you're describing, for better or worse. Do you have a sense of Israel's role in in this Shakespearean drama? Uh, my worry about Israel is that Israel is a democracy, but for a democracy to work, um, you need people engaged in politics. That sounds very mundane, but it's not. You know, poli you know, we live by politics. Without politics, we can't rule ourselves. But there's a large chunk of the Israeli voting population which don't believe in politics. They feel they're divinely inspired, uh, you know, and therefore they're not willing to compromise uh, on anything. You know, everything is a zero-sum game. How do they get power? How do they keep power to do things that they will not uh, debate and compromise about, essentially? So it's like it's the loss of politics in a certain sector of the Israeli population that worries me.